Right, Aurum Gallery, it's another wonderful episode. Now, I've been saving this one. I have been saving this one because this is one of my favourite artists and he's been around such a long time and his journey is an incredible journey. And for those that don't know, Barry Rygate, I've known Barry a very long time. Barry, welcome to Aurum Gallery. Um, and uh, I just want to say, number one, thank you for all that wonderful work back in the summer pre-covid jesus christ i mean yeah. how the world changed but for anyone that doesn't know barry um on another front we met kind of through the galligas or before that maybe i'm not sure how did we meet i don't know i used to go well there's also a friend of ours who used to do eskimo noise do you remember well yes troy and those guys and, and yeah all those guys i grew up with those you so, got those guys, and that was Blue Note. So you obviously came to Blue Note a few times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, back in the days. <laughs> <laughs> Thing about Blue Note that people, you know, you'd have a dread standing next to some some white geezer, and he was a graphic designer at Tomato, or some other guy who was a skater, and other one was a dread. So all these different yeah. mix of people, a creative melting pot, if you like. But I think yeah. I think that the art ultimately, because you start, you've been doing art a long time. I mean, well, I've been. Tell me what's your, how did you, what is your story of the of the, the overground art, so to speak? Because I want to get into a little bit later on a remarkable um, story you told me about your father, which I, which I want to get to, which I think is a real Puritan yeah. way of divulging the art. But what was your experience with art earlier on, after Blue Note, let's say? Um, do you know, I've always, it's always been what I wanted to do, basically. So since... I mean, I must have been about, always wanted to draw since I was about, since I could remember like four, four or five years old and sort of always did it. So, and, on, and then as I got, I don't know, like when I was about 11 or 12, you know, I mean, this is going back, you know, born in the seventies, basically I wanted to be a commercial illustrator, which was like graphic design, um, doing, like I wanted to do album covers and stuff, basically. Mm. And I had someone who's a friend of my parents who was actually working for a big company up in town in London. And um, they sort of gave me some advice and, and basically they were doing that, you know, they called it commercial art basically back then. And as I went to, I know, I, back then I managed to get, you know, a degree, a B.Tech in graphic design, a degree in graphic design and fine art, and then took two years out and went back to Goldsmiths to do an M.A. And now back then, it's a different story than now to go to university or college. You know, I, I got, got in, you know, without any money and basically um, with one O level. So for anyone that knows your work, having your work in all in art gallery, the, the scale of your work, there's not yeah. a lot of people, I like to paint big, there's not a lot of people that aren't graffiti writers that are just kind of normal, kind of what you call composite fine art, you know, working yeah. in the scale that you're working in. What's this thing with scale with you? Because it's, they're really big. Um, that's, you know, that's actually the, the paintings in your gallery and like, they're, I usually kind of make bigger paintings. And for me, there's something about, like I love, like working on big, large scale works, because you sort of approach that work, instead of it being like painting, it becomes like a sculpture, you're, like, you're lifting it up, you put it on the floor, you drip in, and you have this kind of physicality mm. to that piece of work. So you're, it's almost like a performance, you're like jumping around, you're walking on the canvas, you're like, I'm, I get out like, you know, sort of angle grinders and start like cutting into this canvas, sticking things on and spraying and putting this and like you know it i don't know it's i find it quite difficult unless it's drawing to make something kind of mm. small because i find that it i almost sort of i suppose there's something about the way that i am the sort of overload the sort of adding on the sort of excess of stuff you know and i it's almost like I, there's an energy that i kind of need to expend and i use it on this canvas and if i got something small um i, I tend to sort of overload it and it I find it kind of doesn't really work for me. Mm. And um, something that I have to kind of, uh, I don't know, maybe I should just sort of 
learn about but i just find that a big big like something big just just it i don't know there's something about it that is this kind of physicality of it i don't know maybe that's the like way of like graffiti but also, walls. But yeah but i also think that the the scale of the ones that we have which are quite big for the artists that we have in the gallery yeah what i love about it is that this there's, there's such a there is such an unplanned naivety and i think in my when i look at it and i love the way that when i look i walk around the gallery and i, and I love it because people love the gallery because of the space that we have yeah. and I think it's very important that i felt that a lot of contemporary galleries just became really claustrophobic and it all became a little bit too boxy i find with this space that your work for me when i stand back and look at it when i'm on my own and i go there there's such a naivety in the work and there's such an honesty in it because it does it does get a little contrived. Like if I've got a concept, I've got to work it out, I'm gonna always gonna be, I'll do the photo shoot, I'll get yeah. the set up, I'll do it, I'll set it up. We're very opposite artists in that sense, where you have this thing where do you, is it a thing where you have this one sketch and everything is gonna evolve around it or orbit around it, or is it literally just no, I'm just gonna lay down on this canvas? It's it's kind of a bit of both. There is some kind of structure to, to like, I might draw a cartoon character. And um, I mean, I've always been into sort of cartoons and stuff. I mean, I worked for Cartoon Network for like, I don't know, three or four years doing storyboards and stuff. And um, even before like I grew up, especially in like in the eighties, you know, cartoons were a big thing. You know, we didn't really, you know, cable TV and stuff. And mm. it, it become like a, big thing and you know as a kid that's kind of like where you escape into these kind of like mad worlds that are alternative to reality and um so i would sort of sit there and draw and i also kind of learned a technical ability to draw through working at a cartoon cha channel you know I, I used to basically that's what's strange like, about you that people don't realize that you've you had this got this mad chaos going in your head but yet you had the ability to go and work at something like cartoon network it Which, kind of is quite mad working. <laughs> well, it's got to be, I mean, yeah. you know, when you think about storyboarding that stuff and and, yeah. uh, and originating characters and crazy yeah. characters, and I mean, that's really, it's a really. There was a lot. There was a lot of stuff that, like, sort of like subtle sort of things we used to put in the background, where like you know, if if we showed the sort of like you know the boss, they would have said you know we try to see if we can get it under their nose and sort of get away with it. And it was <laughs> yeah. a lot, we used to do a lot of stuff like that. And um, I don't know, there was, there's something, it's funny because it's like working for like a big corporation, like, I don't know, Cartoon Network. And then you've got these mad kind of cartoons. You kind of got this really sort of safe structure, sort of, you know, business. And then you've got this mad sort of content, which is the cartoons. Mm. And I suppose some, somehow there's, that going on with like my work I have some kind of there's something there but it's not like a theme or anything like that. it could just be just like a form or like a cartoon and then I kind of like see where it works and sometimes the canvas for me starts controlling me if you get it doesn't it's not me it's like telling me what to do it's like you know that doesn't work or and you have some kind of idea or something that you begin with like a character and then you sort of let it it sort of overrides and it sort of makes you make make it then just sitting there kind of with an idea and saying i'm going to follow these like this concept or a set of rules yeah i think yeah, that, i mean yeah I, I, found, I, go on. I i mean i grew up i mean not grew up i mean i studied an ma at goldsmith which is really really at the time in the 90s like sort of theoretical like sort of fine art and i just wanted to run away from that stuff everyone was just having ideas and i thought the work to me most of the, a lot of people it like that i was with like w were making these ideas but like the work was something different and i just kind of got bored of that and i thought well why don't you do something with a like making something and going well, well what the hell is that you know like boom you know like kind of letting yourself kind of go on that kind of canvas mm. that kind of makes sense. On, on a deep on a deeper level we did a really and you know to this day i don't know where that interview is <laughs> I came to your studio and we had a really great day. Yeah. And it was before you were moving, you said, look, they're going to be doing some stuff, developing the area. And it was kind of sad because you were kind of getting ready for this big shift and you've been in the studio for quite a few years. Yeah. And I, and I remember 
it was a really good interview. I loved it. It was almost, pre- I was kind of, before we even had the idea of the gallery, really, it was just the, the yeah. early beginnings of it. Um, and when I was studying all of these pieces and looking through these pieces, there's, there's something that I want you to kind of, I want to pry into your world a little bit. Because out of yeah. all the artists that I look at in the gallery, you've got a lot going on. There's a lot of depth that there's a lot of kind of psychological meaning or Freudian meaning. So I should be better placed with it. And the idea of, you know, when I play with music, it's like a sense of smell for me or the sense of color and synesthesia. And I look, you look at sounds and I think, and I, I want to take you back to that place, this, this happy place, or, you know, if it's a darker tune, it's the angst of the sound. It's not quite fit yeah. right. And it just moves you in another way. And I find that it's almost, it's like when I look at Berlin's Mickey, you know, Berlin's very, very, ex- it can execute really well. But when I look at the, almost like the, the end of Mickey Mouse, it's like the saddest Mickey Mouse. It's like, it's the yeah. end of it. It's, I don't think you've ever seen this image. It's a very, it's just like the end of it all. And I think with your work, that's a continual thing in your thing where there's this almost alcoholism with the characters where they've just had enough, you know, and some, yeah. some of the red eyes and the bloodshot. And, the, and it's almost like, it always reminds me of that episode of Happy with Red and Stimpy, when Stimpy's so happy and it's like everything cannot be that happy and it's almost falling apart with this forced happiness in the yeah. way that we look at kids or what we think but might it, you know, let's shove the kid in front of the TV, he's going to be happy. Yeah. But I think the people that are making the cartoons, like you said, there's all this subliminal stuff they're putting in there and, it, and, and it's it's... You know what I mean? I, can you explain a little bit about that? This, this, this the, the idea of the out, the, 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 the kind of, it's almost like the cartoon, the character when I see in the newspaper of the, the guy who's had a few bevies with a bowler hat on and he's, he's got like bubbles because he's, you know, he's burping, you know, his whiskey or he's just about lost, it, lost it and he's a bit, he's a bit torn, he's a bit, he has very little clothes. You know what I mean? What is it about that? Um, I mean, I kind of. I mean, there's, there is a, there is a sort of, I mean, like Ren and Stimpy, favorite cartoon, first of all, I love it. I'm reading so much about it at the moment. Like I kind of want to get into an animation myself, which I'm kind of looking into. Um, it, it's, I don't know. I think sometimes, I think, I mean, it's kind of weird now talking about this, like now this, in this moment in time in history with what's going on and what's going on in America right now, because mm. there was something about like these kind of, like cartoons or this kind of world you could put your sort of sub weird subconscious or sort of like all these energies now it looks seems like our world has become that cartoon so, it's a bit, <laughs> so i don't know it's like you know it's kind of <laughs> it is the parody it, the irony and I, yeah and i so i don't know it's kind of weird there is something about like Ren and Stimpy was like that for me. It was like this kind of like, you know, you got this cute little ant, like a cat basically. And they're like chicka chihuahua, like wow. dog. Yeah, tr- and they're just, you know, cute little, but they're just this angst ridden. And there's also something about, you know, cartoons, which is obvious. There's this anthropomorphic thing where you could just, you know, put your, put your you know, you, you kind of humanize these. I mean, they're basically like humans really. They're not they're only because they got ears or, you know, like a weird, towel or something you call them a cat i mean they look nothing like a cat they look so you've got these cartoons where you could sort of put i mean cartoon you can put all this kind of like weird energy or this kind of weird abstraction on life when i see your work barry and i look at it in the distance of the gallery and i move into your work it, it takes me to these places i always remember the, the chance of coming into the unknown and being an unknown artist is very much the same way that I came to Thailand and no one really knew what I did in England. Yeah. I was just Fan Tong, this gold tooth man. But the idea of these paintings mean more to me because I knew the backing story and it was kind of like the, the hand in hand. But the idea of these innocent paintings, these drawings, can you tell me a little bit about the origin of these drawings and the, and the story, if you don't mind, because I feel it's so beautiful with the fact that yeah. you see your father in prison. I mean, it's, it's hard. I mean, I'll I get, I'll say something about this, but 
We can, edit, take out, we can edit and we'll take out whatever you want to take out, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Basically, um, you know, some without it sensationalizing sort of like your dad in prison or whatever, but there is something I remember. I mean, I've always drawn, my dad basically wanted to be an artist and it didn't work out for him. I think he thought there would be a quick fix to make money out of this doing art, which we all know is actually quite is difficult. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And basically, um, you know, I used to go and visit him when he was on various prisons, like for various things that he did um, when I was a child. And uh, we used to visit him around London. And like, it was like Penterville, he was in Worm and Scrubs, he was in Wandsworth. I really do remember Wandsworth a lot. Going up to the doors, letting you in, you know, they search you. Like really, I mean, I must have been about eight years old. Wow. And, you know, and at that age, you know, I had an int- you know, I already had that interest in art. There was something about art, you know. And I think coming on to this, like going to visit him and being in his spaces without really knowing why your dad is there, because, mm. you know, my mum's not going to sort of explain the sort of reasons to why we are visiting him and not seeing him at a house or whatever. And um, he used to basically draw for, for me and my brother and like used to like out of sort of moments of boredom sort of draw these pictures of cartoon characters and he used to tell me how to draw a cartoon like and stuff and like it's funny because over the years I forget that my dad was you know basically wanted to be an artist and like you know and then we used to visit visit him and he used to sort of like do these drawings and there's something I suppose that's in my sort of subconscious or in the back of my head definitely without 100 percent 100 percent which to me still is of art is this this kind of like position of boring or not boring <laughs> boredom which can be like you're bo- boring like i'm bored bored yeah bored basically and trying to create something from that boredom which i think is really important with art it's really underestimated like that that escapism, like yeah escapism but it's also the fact that you know you're you're basically it doesn't really make sense either because you're in a situation but you create something so what out you know at the end of the day if i went to see my dad and talk to him we wouldn't have had a conversation but because we could draw we have a conversation and now there's something going on and there's something happening Boom. inside there it is in, yeah inside inside you know this kind of like weird institution that's incarcerating yeah. your father basically so you know there is something associated with escape with art, there's also something through boredom. And when I do these paintings, like the ones you have at the gallery, you know, you're doing these marks because you're doing something. And it's it's weird because it's about what drives you to to do that. And you you have these sort of subconscious things or these things in the back of your mind, mm. and you place them. You know, I do cartoons and I see where that goes or this, and suddenly you go bang, what is this? I've, I've created something. Here it is there, and it's. It's almost like that kind of cliche. It's not really the result. It's the journey. Do you know what I mean? You're kind of like that. You've got to this point. And obviously, you do look at the result by kind of going, do I collage that? Do I add that there? But there is an important part is that journey of doing that thing, making some thing, which is a painting or this or that. And drawing, to me, and it does come from that sort of weird place in the back of my head, is about sort of boredom and escapism and it's about that immediacy to get something out of your your head and also you know i think it's also therapy as well it's like you know we i was you, just you need to, that. yeah yeah i can't like if i'm can't do something or i you know i have to find something even if it's just that's why i think there's something great about drawing that the humbleness of just having a pencil and just drawing something you know without having the canvas the studio and all this you could just immediately what's in there you just let out and it's not about making sense either it's about sort of i don't know maybe it's about trying to look at it afterwards or consequence but it's about sort of doing something instead of not doing yeah i think you touched on a really important thing barry that i think that's where our worlds do kind of collide in a good way yeah for me I could I've, I I organized my art in such a way because my life was so organized in the way that I was in all these institutes and you've got your name and your collar and you've got to wash your hands at this time and your teeth at this time. Yeah. 
So I use that whole process, but also chopping all of that stuff apart and reassembling it all, you know, and, and vicariously through the hands of another guy in Photoshop, breaking an image down all the yeah. way down in layers to reconstruct it because of the way that I've grown up. I, I really think that you've hit the nail on the head. For me, this is really the therapy. Whether yeah. someone buys it or not, is, is, it's a blessing, yes. But it's almost for me that if I don't paint after a certain amount of time, I start, I start really going a bit weird. I, I start to not, you know, it's the same as the music therapy, the music and the yeah. sound and the resonance for me. I have to have it. I have to have music in a studio when I'm, when I'm painting. I have to have, there are pockets of silence, but there are this thing where, I'm, where if I'm listening to music and I'm deep in the zone, I'll think of a color and think of a concept of what I could do. And now I can break it down and reconstruct it. And because I don't do Photoshop, and it's like an engineer through the vicariously through the hands of other people, that's what makes the adventure for me, to see how much I can control something which I would not necessarily be able to control. But the yeah. freedom part of it is when I'm in the room with the canvas. And I've got, I've, I've got all the graphic steps. I've got all the steps that I need to do. But in between those layers, it's mine. Yeah. Everything in between that, the paint, the splashing, the lines, and it becomes something else. I think that, that comes from the graffiti writer. But I love what you're saying because I, I don't think that, listen, we don't all have to come from the therapy side of it. We don't have to be broken no. to, to, to fix it. But I do right. like the incomplete circle, if you like. And I've yeah. always found that your work is more of a melting pot of ideas. And they're mad, zany ideas that don't make any sense. They're just yeah. photographs of time, just, just, there they are it 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 well it's not really you know it's you know it's like saying it doesn't make it's like music i suppose it's like it doesn't if you think about music too much or write a sheet but it's what you feel you know mm. music's like god that works because it feel you know it's like you hear this or you hear you know it's yeah right. and it's sometimes when you're this is what i'm on about making the work it's like you're trying to let that work tell you because you're trying to have a, dare I say, a relationship with that piece of work. You're trying to make that work kind of like it's telling you to put that red or cover that up or that doesn't work. And like It's what we call, in, in, my, in my world of music, it's called deities. You raise the deities by putting them there. You loop them and this other sound will come out that's not with really the part of the sound. It's like a ghost of the sound, which creates this other thing, which gives me another melody to lace around it. And it's part of the deities. You know, you just get all the right ingredients, like the right colours together, and go, right, how am I going to manifest these deities? And just, and that's that's the same thing. I think it's it's really the same thing. So for a, it, it, for a purist art, for me, it's like Puritan art. There's differences in approaches, but I think you're, I'm finding stuff in your work all of the fucking time. So I'm finding new stuff in there, embedded, and it's almost as if that kind of sleight of hand thing. Yes. It's funny because I do, I do something and then it, I kind of, it's almost like I let myself, you know, something just comes out of my head and I've got this airbrush and I, you know, I can draw with it or write something and like, it's just something and I forget about it. I forget I put it in there and then I think, shit, I put that in there, you know, <laughs> and it is about, you're sort of like, I don't know, you sort of, you know, there's that kind of cliche art and madness, you know, but like you're trying to, you know, I think we're all, yeah, we're, <laughs> But like yeah. at the end of the day, I think we're all mad. But we're we mad. we got the, we got we got the privilege and the luxury to kind of do that. Do you know what I mean, I I'm glad I've got that. You know, I found a place. Well, we create, to yeah, that. we created this space to do that. And I think yeah. the other thing that I think I found in the work, you know, when you think about graffiti as a th as, as it's a primal thing, you should putting these things up. And these guys didn't know these trains were going to last. Yeah, they've been there for like a day. Someone never left the yard. They got buffed. That was it. Move on. You know, and I, I kind of love that. It's very shamanic in the way that, you know, people would do paintings with dust. Some monks would sit down and do a whole painting and just go, the wind comes and blows it away. And it's the impermanence of it. And I, lo I love it what you've you, captured. Yeah, it gives you more. I think, like, when you start, how can I put this as kind of a contradiction, is that you're, when you're less precious about it, but you are really precious, but you have to take <laughs> that stance, like, because it gives you freedom, it gives you, like, when you're too precious, you, you lock yourself, you know, you have to sort of let go, you know, you have to sort of let, 
let go and you make mistakes. You don't move forward unless you make mistakes. You know, you have to kind of like, and sometimes those mistakes work. Sometimes you kind of leave them there or, but it's about, I don't know. It's, I suppose there is something for me, I need to move. I need to keep doing things, need to keep doing things, doing things, doing things, doing things. Probably why I like motorbikes because they get me A to B, not stuck in traffic. I love them. Always been into them. And doing art, I feel like it's like that. And sometimes I'd be honest. Sometimes I do have to sort of hold my, pull the reins and sort of hold myself back because it's almost like I'm, you know, sometimes stop, try and slow down, if you get what I mean. Well, talking, talking of which, for people that, for someone that just watches this for an interest in two artists shooting the breeze, I mean, Barry, you were in the US for a while and you've done many, many shows in the US. You did a couple of big ones there. Well, I've done a few. I mean, I wouldn't say shows, they're like kind of events and stuff, like mm. done a few things. And I did a few things here that went on tour and stuff. And I've had like shows at the Saatchi Gallery. I even did a summer show about sort of the comic and art at the Tate for like one summer a few years back. And then, um, you know, I've done a few. In America, it's, it's more doing these events like I did this thing in a desert where I showed this sculpture like actually was last year which was fun I mean these are non-profit kind of places like I mean you know the obviously Saatchi Gallery isn't like that you, it's a sale basically and then um, but that went on tour and um but yeah there's a there's it's it's weird I'm not really I've done sort of things that are around kind of like sort of art if you get what I mean mm. and basically but you have, made thing, my... you have this thing about which some people shy away from you've really got a lot of time for, for young people that are getting involved in art like you said the sense of community that you've always had with your brother in the boxing gym I don't know maybe I just there's something in the back of, back of me that feels because I've had the privilege to have what I have I feel like there needs to be given back and even, I've done a few projects with like young people but i really would like to do more and get more involved and get more sort of something up and running to that that gives these sort of young people that are less fortunate kind of like an opportunity to express themselves and you know even make you know dare i say it, money out of it and try and make mm. a living because for me it was you know i can't really forget the fact that it's the only thing i knew i didn't know anything else so all I knew was art. So, and it's funny because I've done it since I was about, you know, my mum said she used to pick me up from nursery and I'm making all these kind of like paintings <laughs> and stuff with messy paint. So it's from nurse. So I've always kept on doing it. And it's, and it's weird. That's why I had that relationship with my dad because he knew that I was into art and would draw and try and create a conversation. So, you know, it, it gave me sort of mobility. I, it didn't stop me from visiting my dad and not having anything to talk about and being very, very awkward. It gave it a space in order to have do a you relationship. Ever, you've really made me have another take on it, which not a lot of artists can do. Graffiti writers, some of them, yes. I'm not for 35 years. But in terms of, not that word contemporary, but in terms of just looking at someone's real primal artwork, it's really inspiring, and you're one of my favourite right. artists. And I always say to people when I walk around the galleries, one of my favourite artists is Barry Ryder. Thank you. And, you know, and and you've been around a while, and people don't understand that you're not you're not new in this. Making me sound like a dinosaur. Well, no, <laughs> I mean you know I'm, I'm older than you, mate. Don't worry about that. You got a bit catching up to do, sunshine. But I mean, <laughs> I've just got a strong appreciation of your work, and all of us at Aurum love your work it's the only i mean out of all your work it's the only one that's kind of stayed stationary like well, i won't move it out i'm moving mine around and moving other people's work around i just love it. it's got its own place do you know what i mean and, and and it's that's kind of what the museum element is for me that this that, that you've got to take time with these things you know what i mean well thanks for inviting me you know to do it and like you know well you asking. would have bloody been here i'm sure you were going to visit us and it's just you, you know, know what i had a plan you know i'm sure a lot of people uh, yeah but you know it, lovely, awesome. man. it would have been lovely it would have been you know but i'm sure i'm sure it will be in the future it will this one yeah, this move on but i thank you so much for your time the most precious thank commodity you. apart from toilet roll the most precious <laughs> commodity you can give me is your time and we're so happy to have you as part of our family and i mean you've always been part of my family anyway right here so and you